to make an appeal to chaos is the only way to save the logos is one sentence from the final chapter actually the appendix uh, appendix number two which is the final section in Alexander Dugan's the fourth political theory which I'll be reading and doing a close reading for you guys here uh, it's entitled the metaphysics of chaos and in this appendix he's going to outline how the logos itself has been destroyed and the only way to potentially save it is by uh, finding and engaging with a more in a very specific more originary sense of chaos and he's going to outline two forms of chaos and make a distinction between uh, the traditional mathematical form of chaos that can be thought of as confusion and a more um, more primordial understanding of chaos which was a sort of pre-order uh, I was I thought of it as like that which was uh, present when um, in Genesis that was formed and creation was formed out of now interestingly here he does not and I don't see him his understanding of the logos as he describes it here having really anything to do in this context with Christ uh, and I find this interesting right because Alexander Dugan is a Orthodox Christian and the term logos is inextricably linked with um, with Christ, but he is using it here in a really historical, metaphysical, philosophical sense. And he says that this metaphysics of chaos may be the only pathway forward. Um, and he says, perhaps it is the other beginning Heidegger spoke of. Um, so the other beginning is a way of understanding philosophy as it was first experienced by the pre-Socratics. A lot of the um, catastrophes that we are witnessing in modernity and postmodernity are a result, Dugan says, you know, uh, taking from Heidegger as a confusing of the original impetus of the question of being that was instantiated at the beginning of philosophy. Um, so the metaphysics of chaos uh, is, is this last appendix that we're going to read through. It's not too long. And I would love to know what you guys think of this concept and of these concepts. Uh, and please let me know in the comments. I would love to engage with you all. I find this definitely uh, thought provoking. So starting out, he says, modern European philosophy began with the concept of logos and the logical order of being. For over 2000 years, this concept became fully exhausted. All the potentialities and the principles laid in this logocentric way of thinking have been now thoroughly explored, exposed, and abandoned by philosophers. However, the problem of chaos and the nature of chaos was neglected and put aside from the very beginning of this philosophy. The only philosophy we know at present is the philosophy of logos. But chaos is something opposite to logos, its absolute alternative. From the 19th century and continuing it until the present day, the most important and brilliant European philosophers, such as Friedrich Nietzsche and Martin Heidegger, began to suspect that the Logos was fast approaching its end. Some of them dared to suggest that, from now on, we are living in a time of the end of logocentric philosophy and approaching something else. European philosophy was based on the logocentric principle corresponding to the principle of exclusion, the differentiating. Greek uh, diaresis, which is a term used originally by Plato in his dialogues, which refers to a group of concepts or objects which are divided and subdivided until a definition of the item in question has been found. So the roots of the Socratic method. All this corresponds strictly to the masculine attitude and reflects a patriarchal, authoritative, vertical, and hierarchical order of being and knowledge. All the things post-modernity has critiqued. The masculine approach to reality imposes order and the principle of exclusivity everywhere. That is perfectly manifested in Aristotle's logic where the principles of identity and exclusion are put in the central position in the normative manner of thinking. A is equal to A, not equal to not A. This identity excludes non-identity, altiarity, the term alterity first defined in its modern usage by Emmanuel Levinas, uh, which refers to the otherness, meaning the act of exchanging one's perspective for that of the theoretical other. 
Here is the male who speaks, thinks, acts, fights, divides, orders, and so on. Nowadays, all this logocentric philosophy has come to an end, and we must consider another road for thought, not in the logocentric, phallocentric, hierarchical, and exclusivist way. The logo, if logos no longer satisfies us, fascinates us, or mobilizes us, then we are inclined to try something else, and at last to address the problem of chaos. To begin with, there are two different concepts of chaos. Modern physics and philosophy refers to complex systems, bifurcations, or non-integrating equations and processes, using the concept chaos to designate such phenomena. They understand by that not by the absence of order, but a more complicated form of order that is difficult to perceive as such and is, in fact, its essence. Such chaos or turbulence is calculable in nature, but with more sophisticated theoretical and mathematical means and procedures than the instruments that classical natural science is dealing with. The term chaos is used here in a metaphorical manner. In modern science, we are continuing to deal with an essentially logocentric manner of exploring reality. So the chaos here is no more than a dissipative structure of logos, the last result of its decay, fall, and decomposition. Modern science is dealing not with something other than logos, but with a kind of post-logos, or ex-logos, logos in the state of ultimate dissolution and regression. The process of the final destruction and dissipation of logos is taken here for chaos. In reality, though, it has nothing to do with chaos as such, with chaos in the original Greek sense of the term. It is rather a kind of utmost confusion. René Ganon has called the era we are living through now an era of confusion. Quote unquote, confusion means the state of being that both runs parallel to order and precedes it. Thus, we should make a clear distinction between two different concepts. On the one hand, we have the modern concept of chaos that represents post-order, or a mixture of contradictory fragments of being without any unity and order linked amongst themselves by highly sophisticated post-logical correspondences and conflicts. Gilles Deleuze has called this phenomenon a, quote, non-co-possible system composed by the multitude of the monads, close quote, using the concept of monads and co-possibility introduced by Leibniz, becoming for Deleuze the nomads. Deleuze describes postmodernity as a sum of non co possible fragments which can coexist. I have a pretty um, thorough, not thorough, but I have probably 12, 15 videos on Deleuze in a playlist. Feel free to check that out if you want to get more familiar with this thinker. It was not possible in Leibniz's vision of reality based on the principle of co possibility. But within postmodernity, we can see excluding elements coexisting. The non order and non co possible monads or nomads swarming around could seem to be chaotic. And in this sense, we usually use the word chaos in everyday speech. But strictly speaking, we should make a distinction. And here he's going to drive home this, this distinction between these two concepts of, of chaos. He says, we need to distinguish between. Two kinds of chaos the postmodernist chaos as an equivalent to confusion a kind of post order and the greek chaos as pre-order as something that exists before ordered reality has come into being only the latter can be considered as chaos in the proper sense of the word the second but actually the original conception of chaos should be examined carefully and metaphysically so in terms of these two uh, concepts of order, we're, we're working with the latter of this or chaos um, that was, we can think of as a pre-order. Continuing on, he says, the epic vision of the rise and fall of Logos in the course of the development of Western philosophy and Western history was first espoused by Martin Heidegger, who argued that in the context of European or Western culture, Logos is not only a primary philosophical principle, but also the basis of the religious attitude forming the core of Christianity. We can also notice that the concepts of kalam, or intellect, is at the center of Islamic philosophy and theology. The same is true for Judaism, 
at least in the vision of Philo of Alexandria, and above all in medieval Judaism and the Kabbalah. Thus, in high modernity, where we are living, we assist the fall of, of Logos, accompanied by the corresponding decline of classical Greco-Roman culture and monotheistic religion as well. Death of God. These processes of decadence are completely parallel to what Martin Heidegger considers the present condition of Western culture as a whole. He identifies the origin of this condition of decline in some of the hidden and hardly recognizable errors committed during the early stages of Greek thought. Something went wrong at the very beginning of Western history, and Martin Heidegger sees this wrong turn precisely in the affirmation of the exclusivist position of an exclusivist logo, logos. The shift was made by Heraclitus and Parmenides, but above all by Plato, with the development of philosophic thought that envisaged two worlds or layers of reality where existence was perceived as the manifestation of the hidden. Later, this hidden element was recognized as logos, as the idea, the paradigm, the example. From that point on, the referential theory of truth proceeds. Truth lies in the fact of the immediate correspondence of the given to the presumed invisible essence or the, quote, nature that likes to hide, according to Heraclitus. The pre-Socratics were at the forefront of this philosophy. The unfettered explosion of the modern technique is its logical result. Heidegger calls it gestalt and thinks it is the reason for the catastrophe and annihilation of mankind that inev inevitably approaches. According to him, the very concept of Logos was wrong, so he proposed to radically revise our attitude to the very essence of philosophy and the process of thought and to find another way which he called the other beginning. Logos first appeared with the birth of Western philosophy. The earliest Greek philosophy arose as something that already excluded chaos. Precisely at the same time, Logos began to flourish, revealing a kind of mighty will to power and the absolutization of the masculine attitude to reality. The becoming of logocentric culture ontologically annihilated the polar opposite to Logos itself, the feminine chaos. So chaos as something that preceded Logos was abolished by it and its exclusivity were both manifested and dismissed at the same time. Masculine logos ousted feminine chaos. Ex exclusivity and exclusion subdued inclusivity and the inclusion. So the classical world was born, stretching its limits for 2,500 years up until modernity and the rationalistic scientific era. This world has come to its end, but nevertheless, we are still living in its outskirts. At the same time, in the dis dissipating postmodern world, all the structures of order are degrading, dispersing, and becoming more and more confused. It is the dusk of Logos, the end of order, the last chord of masculine exclusivist domination. But, but, but still, we are inside the logical structure rather than outside it. By stating this, we have conjured some basic solutions concerning the future. The first possible solution is the return to the kingdom of Logos, the conservative revolution, the restoration of male full-scale domination in all spheres of life, in philosophy, religion, and in everyday life. This could be done spiritually, socially, or technically. This way where technique meets spiritual order was fundamentally explored and studied by Heidegger's friend Ernst Junger. It is a return to classicism accompanied by an appeal to technological progress. It is an effort to save the falling logos, the restoration of traditional society, and the eternally new order. The second possible solution is to accept the current trends and, and to follow the direction of confusion, becoming more and more involved in the dissipation of structure and post-structuralism and trying to get pleasure out of the comfortable glide into nothingness. So here he's juxtaposing these two paths of resurrecting the Logos. One is this conservative um, position, and the second one is this liberal position. He says, 
That is the option chosen by the left and the liberal representatives of postmodernity. It is modern nihilism at its best, originally identified by Nietzsche and explored thoroughly by Heidegger. The concept of nothing being the potential present in the principle of identity proper to Logos itself is not the limit of the process of the fall of the logical order, but rather the construction of a rational realm of the unlimited expansion of her horizontal decay, the incalculable multitudes of the flowers of putrefaction. He's going to introduce this third path here. He says, however, we could choose a third way and try to transcend the borders of Logos and step out beyond the crisis of the postmodern world that is literally postmodern, i.e. lying beyond modernity, where the dissipation of Logos reaches its limit. So the question of this very limit is crucial. Seen from the standpoint of Logos in general, including its most decayed aspects, beyond the domain of order lies nothing. So crossing the border of being is ontologically impossible. Nothing is not. So speaks all logocentric Western ontology after Parmenides. This impossibility asserts the infiniteness of the outskirts of logos and grants to the decay inside the realm of order eternal continuity. Beyond the order of being lies nothing and to move toward this limit is an analytically infinite and unending the aporia of Zeno of Aelia are here fully valid. So no one can cross that frontier into the non-existent non-being that is simply is not. If we insist nevertheless in doing this, then we should appeal to chaos in its original Greek sense as to something that precedes being and order, something pre-ontological. We stand in front of a really important and crucial problem. A great number of people today are unsatisfied with what is going on around us, with the absolute crisis of values, religions, philosophy, political and social order, with postmodern conditions, with the confusion and perversion, and with this age of the utmost decay in general. But considering the essence of the decline of our civilization to the present state, we cannot look at to the preceding phases of the logocentric order and its implicit structures because it was precisely logos itself that has brought things to the state where they are now bearing within itself the germs of the present decay heidegger identified with extreme credibility the roots of the technique in the pre-socratic solution to the problem of being by means of logos Logos cannot save us from the situation that it is the cause of. Logos is of no use to us here anymore. I find that he contradicts himself here in, in a bit. Continuing, only the pre-ontological chaos can give us a hint about how to go beyond the trap of postmodernity. It was put aside on the eve of the creation of the logical structure of being as a cornerstone. Now it, is, now it is its turn to come into play. Otherwise, we will be doomed to accept the post-logical dissipated post-modernity that pretends to be the eternal in some way because it annihilates time. Modernity has killed eternity and post-modernity is killing time. The architecture of the postmodern world is completely fragmented, perverse and confused. It is a labyrinth without an exit as folded and twisted as a Mobius strip. Logos, which was the guarantor of strictness and order, serves here instead to grant curvature and crookedness, being used to, perverse, to preserve the impassibility of the ontological border with nothing from the eventual and inevitable trespassers seeking to escape into the beyond. So the only way to save ourselves, to save humanity and culture from this snare, is to take the step beyond the logocentric culture towards chaos. We cannot restore logos and order because they bear in themselves the reason for their own eternal destruction. In other words, to save the exclusive logos, we should make an appeal to the alternative inclusive instance that is chaos. But how could we use the concept of chaos and base our philosophy on it? Up to now, philosophy has always been for us something logical by definition. In order to resolve this difficulty, we should approach chaos, not from the position of Logos, but from the position of chaos itself. 
It can be compared to the feminine vision, the feminine understanding of the other that is not excluded, but on the contrary, includes in the sameness, included in the sameness. Logos regards itself as what is and as what is equal to itself. It can accept the differences inside itself because it excludes the other that lies without. So the will to power is working the law of sovereignty. Beyond Logos, Logos asserts lies nothing, not something. So Logos excluding all other than itself excludes chaos. Chaos uses a different strategy. It includes in itself all that is, but at the same time all that it is not. So all-inclusive chaos includes also that which is not inclusive, namely that which excludes chaos. So chaos does not perceive Logos as the other, but as itself or as something non-existent. Logos as the first principle of exclusion is included in chaos, present in it, enveloped by it, and has a place granted inside of it, as the mother bearing the baby bears in herself what is part of herself and what is not part of herself at the same time. Man conceives woman as an external being and seeks to penetrate her. Women considers man as something internal and seeks to give him a birth and to give birth to him. Chaos is the eternal nascence of the other, that is, of Logos. To sum up, chaotic philosophy is possible because chaos itself includes Logos as some inner possibility. It can freely identify it, cherish it, and recognize its exclusivity included in its everlasting life. So we come to the figure of the very special chaotic Logos, that is, a completely and absolutely fresh Logos being eternally revived by the waters of chaos. This chaotic Logos is at the same time exclusive, that is why it is properly Logos and inclusive, being chaotic. It deals with the sameness and otherness differently. Chaos can think. We should ask her how she does what she does. We have asked Logos, now it is, turn, it is the turn of chaos. We must learn to think with chaos and within chaos. I could suggest as an example the philosophy of the Japanese thinker, Kitaro Nishida, who has constructed the logic of Basho, or the logic of places, in place of Aristotle's logic. We should explore their cultures rather than Western to try to find different examples of inclusive philosophy, inclusive religions, and so on. Chaotic Logos is not only an abstract construction. If we seek well, we can find the real forms of such intellectual traditions in archaic societies as well as in Eastern theology and mystical currents. To make an appeal to chaos is the only way to save Logos. Logos needs a savior. It cannot save itself. It needs something opposite to itself to be restored in the critical situation of postmodernity. We could not transcend postmodernity. The latter cannot be overcome without appeal to something that has been prior to the reason of its decay. So we should resort to philosophies other than Western. In conclusion, it is not correct to conceive chaos as something belonging to the past. Chaos is eternal, but eternally coexisting with time. Therefore, chaos is always absolutely new, fresh, and spontaneous. It could be regarded as a source of any kind of invention and freshness because its eternity has in itself always something more than was, is, or will be in time. Logos itself cannot exist without chaos, like fish cannot live without water. When we take a fish out of the water, it dies. When the fish begins to insist excessively that there is something other than water around it, even if it is true, it comes to the shore and dies there. It is kind of a mad fish. When we put it back in the water, it only jumps out again. So let it die this way if it wants. There are other fishes deep in the water. Let us follow them. The astronomical era that is coming to an end is the era of the fish constellation of Pisces, the fish on the shore, the dying one. So we need water now very badly. Only a completely new attitude to thought, a new ontology, and a new gnosiology can save Logos out of the water, on the shore, in the desert that grows and grows as Nietzsche foresaw. 
Only chaos and the alternative philosophy based on inclusivity can save modern humanity and the world from the consequence of the degradation and decay of the exclusivist principle called Logos. Logos has expired, and we all will be buried under its ruins unless we make an appeal to chaos and its metaphysical principles and use them as a basis for something new. Perhaps this is the other beginning Heidegger spoke of. There you have it. Uh, please tell me your thoughts if you have any. Thank you for listening, and until next time, God bless.